Happy Friday, everyone. We are <laughs> excited to bring you our next Prank Friday this week with the most incredible Mia Ando. Uh, but first, let me introduce my partner in crime, Ellie Hayworth. Ellie is the CEO and founder of Hayworth, a communications consultancy committed to promoting intrepid ideas in art and design. Ellie has grown her business to command a full scope of client services, including PR, content development, business strategy, strategic partnerships, events, speaking engagements, you <laughs> name it, Ellie can help. And Mia. Mia is a New York-based visual artist, most known for her landscape-inspired paintings and sculptural works that document transformations within systems of the natural world. Her work is concerned with the changing elements of nature and its relationship to our increasingly fragile environment. You may have seen her stunning work at the Noguchi Museum in New York or at Crystal Bridges or at one of the many institutions that house her work in their public collections like LACMA. We are very excited about this Frank Friday and let's get started. Amazing, thank you so much, Carlina. And Mia, I am particularly excited to be chatting with you today. Um, maybe just as kind of a, a foundational question, we could chat a little bit more. Um, can you give me kind of the elevator pitch, if you will, on, on your art practice and some of the themes that you're exploring? Sure. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to you both. I love art, frankly, and of course, it's really <laughs> lovely to spend this time with you guys in um, during COVID. I think these to connect to people in this way is it's it's really great. So it it allows me to have um, some connection to yeah. you both and also the um, art world and the world in, in a broader scope. Um, so my practice uh, really stems from uh, the use of multiple mediums. I, I work with uh, primarily elemental materials, mm -hmm. wood, fire, metal, um, I depict air. Uh, for the most part, my interest is in looking at examining ephemeral phenomena in nature. So transitory things, uh, things that are in this state of change. So dusk and dawn and clouds and things that are just right really in the moment of transformation. Um, I really have been inspired for a number of reasons with this transitory natural uh, phenomena. Um, I, my sort of background is um, I've been indoctrinated into mm -hmm. sort of um, a, a country, uh, not a country, but a, a, I'm half Japanese. And yeah. there is, Japan is very particular. Uh, there really isn't any other society or culture that has uh, placed such a profound importance and reverence and respect for nature. And it really is ubiquitous. It's, it's um, in the philosophy, it, it really stems from the native religion Shinto that deifies mm -hmm. nature and natural phenomena, but also in terms of Buddhism, that has a primary focus of uh, looking at impermanence of all things. So those are really the 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 kind of conceptual ideas that have informed my practice. And, and then I go about um, in examining these ideas through painting, sculpture, um, currently involved in very large scale drawing. Um, you might, I, I think I'm mostly known for the paintings um, on metal. I, I've been using metal as a material that has an ability to redirect light and, and uh, reflect uh, mm -hmm. quite fleeting elements of light. Um, I, I've also had a, uh, a public practice or I've, I've made a, a number of 
large scale installations in in nature or out outdoors. Um, yeah. I really have a a love for public art as a counterbalance mm -hmm. to the the um, the the art uh, my gallery my studio practice. Yeah, I think I mean Mia. First of all, you're such a prolific artist, and I think the breadth of materials that you use, as well as the themes that you you explore, um, are particularly resonant. I think considering the past, you know, six to eight months that we've all been experiencing, um, you know, one of the themes I think that stands out the most to me is this idea of kind of the temporal and the ephemera. Um, and I think, you know, we as a society have been kind of renegotiating themes related to time, um, perhaps taking a little bit more um, reverence, as you say, looking at nature. So I'm curious to hear a little bit, um, perhaps about the kind of the past six months. Um, when we last spoke with you for a Frank talk, we were just, I think, at the onset um, mm -hmm. if not just a bit before the pandemic really kind of sunk into our society. Um, right. How are you renegotiating themes related to time and ephemera when they feel so pertinent to everybody today? COVID, <clears throat> in a very literal sense, this period has, I think for many people, created a, a, a different relationship to time. I feel that many people, including myself, feel that time sort of slowed, especially mm -hmm. here in New York City where we're all um, quite busy and, and there's a robust sort of scheduling. And, and um, my experience with this particular time has been one of reflection where things are really slowed down and it's given me um, an opportunity to really re-examine what I'm making and why. And I think that reset has been really beneficial um, in my practice. I started my reaction to the lockdown uh, here in mm -hmm. New York that occurred, I think I, my, we started in March 15th. And on that day, um, I started just a, intuitively because we were all told to go home and, and not, um, you know, I've, I've been coming to the studio seven days a week since 2003. I have a very, very uh, disciplined approach to yeah. uh, the work that I do. And so a shift of that nature, uh, the, the gravitas that I felt um, sort of encouraged encouraged an action, which was to draw a moon of that night, every single night That's or amazing. every single day. So I started a brand new calendar, which is began on the, the first day of lockdown and have been observing and drawing that night moon uh, ever since and now we're in our 300 we're mm -hmm. we're you know deep deep into and we're still in lockdown so examining you know time is a construct examining our relationship to time and perhaps now that there's a new sense of time this is a time mm -hmm. of when covid began and so i've been doing a lot of um i i I've, I've been writing a book <laughs> about the moon and celestial observations yeah. for a couple of years now. So um, I thought to myself, well, I'll illustrate um, mm -hmm. this book. And, and there are um, a number of uh, different names in the Japanese language for various conditions of mm -hmm. uh, the moon and lunar phases. And I thought, well, this is a perfect time to illustrate and it became something where since the world was basically on fire and everything changed um, really immediately, I sought solace and mm -hmm. took great, great comfort in sitting on our deck and looking outside and seeing that the moon still comes out every night and the moon is still going through its phases and, and everything has sort of changed in with, with within the perspective of, of sort of our humanity and, and what we're doing in the city, but yet these systems in nature, um, which have always been 
the cornerstone of, of my work. It's been the foundation mm -hmm. of my work to examine nature in its specific system. So there are all these series of works that I do and the interrelationship between uh, these systems in nature and our relationships. So we are also nature, we are natural. And I think we've, with our technological advances, We've grown far from that. I don't know. My husband told me, oh, um, <laughs> honey, you're, the, you're looking at the moon and the clouds. All the, I look up a lot, apparently. <laughs> I said, most people don't do that. And I said, okay, well, we all have an, a, an individual experience. Mm -hmm. and relationship to nature, but it belongs to us all. And so that has been um, something that I've been re-examining. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And I think there's- Sorry, that is a very long end. <laughs> no, not at all. And I think it was very, um, I mean, it was very emblematic, both of your approach as well as, you know, I don't want to allude to the fact that the pandemic has in any way um, you know, been a kind of a productive opportunity in certain cases, but I think if you are looking at the silver not linings, to be able to see something like the moon and identify these senses of constancy and also perhaps practice a little bit more mindfulness in the fact that we can't control, you know, the state of beings at all times. And so learning to kind of move with the tides and create systems, personal systems that Sure. you know, are capitalizing on kind of the challenges that we're all seeing. I think, you know, there's kind of an interesting, I think, dichotomy between what can be an obstacle, but also is a bit of a, a silver lining, as as I said. So, no, I, I think, think it was so. a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was lovely. I, you know, the, there are, obviously, COVID has um, caused a tremendous amount of suffering and, and hardship. And we've all had a reckoning with ourselves and our businesses and our, our practices. I, I, um, I've been counting my lucky stars, but yeah. I've been counting my blessings rather Perhaps than- Perhaps literally. <laughs> yeah, it's so cute, yes. No, I love and, it. You know, I, I think we each um, in a variety of ways have felt um, the, this this situ you know of, of course I, I i i miss my family you know i miss my sure. friends and and all of all of these things but also a moment to slow down and to contemplate and to reset mm -hmm. has is is quite important and i i would i have always tried within my practice and my paintings and sculpture to examine very carefully and crystallize fleeting moments or, or changes in nature. But it has put that into a very, a, a, a different sort of context in that I, I have a specific kind of programming. I, I, was raised in, uh, I was raised in Japan, I was raised by Japanese people and they have elevated nature to this really high status, unlike many, many cultures, it's a very distinctive culture. So I have my own programming. I'm compelled yeah. and, 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 it, and it's a choice. I also feel an obligation and a deep love, a deep, deep love, which is really yeah. the thing. Um, and, but yet we're all shaped by our environment mm -hmm. and, and our framework. Mm -hmm. I think so. And, and that individuality to pursue, I, I, I'm making the work that I make because I can't make any other work. It always mm -hmm. leads back to these images. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in really, uh, I guess it's embracing that. I struggle as well. I look at my heritage. I'm a mixed person. I've got mm -hmm. two very uh, opposing or, 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 or different disparate uh, cultures. But I think that regardless of, of, Kind of my own personal experience each person that individuality it doesn't matter who you are you're important your voice is important mm -hmm. in that and to pursue that very particular set 
of influences that each person has had, that is important. And I, I think of it's course. less about kind of um, the way that uh, I put forth images and what I see in it. It's really about trying to make images and an experience that people can bring their own yes. individuality and history to it. And so that's really become uh, highlighted. It was always yeah. important, but the, but I think that individual um, power that people have, mm -hmm. and it, I've really noticed it throughout the course of this lockdown and in all of the, here in in um, the United States, the those issues have become quite important. And for me, yes. as as a person who really, I, I I'm very much um, a product of my environment and that conditioning mm -hmm. of looking at nature and caring about nature has, and the former administration sort of um, ignoring the fact yeah. that our environment. We are at the brink of a very important moment where we can impact mm -hmm. uh, a change within mm -hmm. this sort of change that is occurring in our mm -hmm. environment. Our environment is changing. I am a woman who has been translating and looking at ancient calendars, Japanese moon calendars, ancient systems, 72 seasons is what Japan had, a season yeah. for every, and these seasons were based upon observations of nature. Those are mm -hmm. different now. Why? Because of our collective tiny little actions. And therefore I, I do say that the individual is tremendously powerful mm -hmm. and we're powerful as a, as a collective, but it's also, um, I think many people think that I make very, you know, oh, the, that's a really beautiful cloud. It's in, and I, it is important to put forth frozen moments of mm -hmm. in my Beauty. life these are clouds that I saw that cloud it passed really really quickly it was something it was a place a time a date an interaction mm -hmm. that I had that cloud is never going to be again that moment mm -hmm. has passed and it may be not to sound too dramatic about it but it could be forever mm -hmm. we could pollute the sky potentially and there will be no more clouds for example mm -hmm for example, and I'm not to be preachy about it. And I've never wanted to make didactive work. So um. no, but it, I mean, it sounds to me like there is far more than just I mean, the intentionality behind the work goes well beyond just what someone is seeing um, at face value. It's about this kind of this moment, this transience. It's also about the greater implications about kind of the respect for and the honoring of um, both the system of nature as well as kind of our relationship to it. So I think it's certainly very resonant in just how beautiful the treatment of the subject matter is. So there I think this, it certainly comes through in the work. Thank you. There is of course. such a beautiful idea, um, a concept in the Japanese language, and it's called mono no aware. So mono no aware translates it's a sort of a, it's a complicated um, concept, but I will explain it in the way that I understand it. And it yeah. is, it is a profound love and respect for something that changes and an acknowledgement of the beauty in things that change and are, mm -hmm. are temporal. And within that is a wistfulness. So there is a, a recognition and there's a, a little bit of a sorrow in the comprehension that everything is transitory. Mm -hmm. So there's almost uh, the way that I see it, it's an acceptance. It's an acceptance of sure. everything being transitory and that we all share all things, all people. This is a main tenet of Buddhism as well as quantum physics, then quantum mm -hmm. mechanics, this is an idea. Mm -hmm. But this word mono no aware is really um, encapsulates, I think some of uh, this ethos. So mm -hmm. some people say that it's the pathos of things. So it is this condition that 
to be awakened to this each fleeting moment. So it's a presence in, in mo the moment that has now passed. And it was beautiful. And, and, and that reckoning of, oh, it's a sort of a, a lucky moment. When, I, when I, I, my husband and I were in Montauk, I'm working on these rising tides uh, series and looking okay. at the snow falling on these waves. Mm -hmm. and, and that wave is, is such a profound and sublime moment. Mm -hmm. And to capture that, right? I work with, a, with photography as the quickest and most technologically accurate way to, to capture a free sure. that moment. A moment. And then like, a, you know, the 18th century romantic painters it would bring that back to the studio and to translate and manipulate that and to share that moment. It's just, uh, so this um, idea I, I, is, is a profoundly uh, beautiful idea. And so I've been thinking um, very much about, about those things. I, I think that is incredible. And one of the themes that seems to stand out out of all that we're kind of speaking about today is this idea of kind of taking taking a, taking time and and perhaps slowing down and um maybe you know i'm putting my editorial cap on it but editing to a certain degree and so i think out of this conversation i'd be curious to hear a little bit more um you know one of the things that we've been speaking about a lot with these frank fridays is you know, we went from an art world where there was, I mean, we were all on kind of the art fair circuit. We were all, you know, our schedules were insanely packed, mm -hmm. um, perhaps to a fault, because in a certain way we were all stuck in a rhythm and maybe we're not taking the time to really reflect on, on you know, the heart of our practices, what, whatever those practices may be. Um, I'm curious to hear just now that certain things have fallen away, how have you managed to stay connected? Um, when we spoke for the Frank talk a few year, or a few months ago, you were seeing a bunch of shows and you were participating in all of these kind of social endeavors. So I'm mm -hmm. curious to hear how that has changed for you or how you filled that void with other forms of connectivity, if you will. <clears throat> it's, it's very different and my husband is shelter is um, we're both artists, so okay. uh, we were, like most New York artists, very um, embedded in going to yeah. see shows. And um, so I have, I, I, to answer your question about staying connected, I think doing things like this, where yeah. you can still engage people and um, it's been an adjustment, technically speaking, uh, with the Zoom and whatnot, because mm -hmm. much of the work I make is experiential and the materials uh, I'm engaged in, in a practice of working with materials that shift and that interact with the environment. So that has been, um, it's, it's been a, a challenge to depict those, those works. Um, and really more, I, the more I realize that interaction of um, a direct nature, the, the, the value of that. But in mm -hmm. lieu of that, I think it's, it's, it's been wonderful to view works. I've always, you know, I, I am not too involved with Instagram, but looking at things Sure. Um, on the screen or on, on, on the computer is one way of viewing things that is its own, its own different sort of mm -hmm. experience. And I like the, I love to see what people are making. People are, are artists and are the, that commitment that artists have is, it's so beautiful when I see my friends mm -hmm. and they're just in their studios and they're there. And it doesn't matter ultimately, I think is, is the external world goes on, but our internal worlds and our commitment and really it's a, it's, it's a compulsion to make sure. things and to sure. continue. I, for my own practice, each work comes out of the last work. So that continuum is mm. very important in my practice. It is all of the work is interrelated and I look at my friends and I see them and, and say hi to them on, 
on um, Instagram or Zoom or FaceTime and, and people are, are continuing on that path regardless of sure. what external forces or factors. Sure. So that is very lovely to see. Um, I've, I've always, um, you know, I was, I was an academic um, in, my, in my formal education um, and so I've gone really back to looking at historic texts sure. and looking, as I said, at these ancient calendars yeah. and picking and, and having, picking up books and looking at that relationship. I'm, I'm quite fond of, I'm quite yeah. fond of uh, the how things were before you're reading everything on the phone and whatnot. So I've, I've really enjoyed um, having the time and the, the freedom to really look very, very closely and very deeply at, at things that are ancient. Yes. And yes. looking at the way that um, that Para these paradigms can interact and it's really shed a lot of light um, for my own uh, yeah. way of uh, making and thinking. That's amazing. Um, I think all of this begs the question, what, um, maybe you can speak about a milestone or a new body of work. I mean, is there, what projects mm -hmm. are you working on that we can stay tuned and see what has precipitated from this, <laughs> what seems like a very productive time, despite all of the, the loss that we've experienced? It has been a productive time. Um, I'm fortunate in that we live, um, my husband and I live not far from my studio and I've been able to adjust my schedule. I, I mean, really, if, um, yes, being an artist, you see an artist in these little snippets when they're out at an art fair, or I don't really attend too many art fairs, but at a party or at, at an sure. opening, but really there, for myself, there has not been a radical shift in that I spend 90% of my time alone in my Perfect. studio. That's where I belong. I, oops, oops. <laughs> sorry, I'm having a technical okay. problem. Uh, that <laughs> is, you know, you, there is um, a, for artists, we spend time happily uh, yeah. alone, um, thinking and making. So that, uh, that I've just continued right along that path. There, there, there has n have not been radical shifts early on March, uh, April, May, in the early part of the lockdown, um, the first thing that occurred was obviously I, I went home and, and started drawing. The second thing that occurred was that um, I did not have access because everything was closed to sure. ga getting my normal paper and my metal and my glass and my wood. You know, that, that sort of all stopped. It just all stopped. So that caused something interesting to happen to my studio, um, I found, <laughs> I didn't find, I have indigo and I've always oh, loved amazing. indigo for an, a number of reasons. Um, but I started an indigo vat and it, natural indigo. So it's a leaf, it's a plant. It's, and sure. that led down a rabbit hole that, um, gave me a, a sort of a, an interesting period. Um, and it sort of reminded me a little bit of when I was younger and maybe starting out where there really, there were no consequences. I was only sure. working with the indigo and I, I, my approach is considered by some to be unconventional. So I uh, making paintings on wood panel with the indigo, making drawings directly on washi paper with the indigo, which yeah. is a little bit of an unusual thing. Um, but that ultimately, um, I lived in Japan as, as a little girl. My mom is Japanese and mm -hmm. I lived in a Buddhist temple with where my grandfather was the head priest um, in a town called Okayama, uh, which in the country, indigo is ubiquitous. It's, it's 
it's used for pragmatic things like cushions and jackets and sure. curtains and and so the color out in the country we my family is out uh, the temple is surrounded by rice fields and i sought to really soothe myself and i uh, and place myself in my sort of happiest safest peaceful place when I was as a girl with my grandparents and my parents and my sister and living in this environment and it looked blue to me okay so this indigo it was like wrapping myself with Mm -hmm. this color that was so soothing and of course it is the color of all of my favorite things like the ocean, if you're familiar with my work, I do a lot of work with space and um, Mm -hmm. the deep parts of the ocean. So all of those things. And so that was my, um, my particular, um, and in my heart, that's, that's where it started. And then it's led me. (laughs) So it's a new body of work. It it is a new body. How excited. I keep doing that. I, I can show (laughs) a little bit of where it's kind of brought me to the this is um 79 by 79 inches it's it's Japanese spectacular uh washi paper and it can sort of show a little bit of how this imagery is manifest um this particular oh this is also a little bit of a different whoops a little bit I'm not sure if I'm doing that very well but so this notion of um, working with, you know, this piece of kozo paper, it was a mulberry tree a couple of years ago. So oh, the idea yeah. of uh, working with these materials that come from nature, the sure. indigo, as I said earlier, is a plant, sure. um, and depicting and freezing these transitory moments of the ocean and waves and the rising or setting moon in a content text of um, tides rising and oceans rising. Sure. And really, I, I've i always been, my vernacular is always very tranquil and quietude is quite important for me and Mm -hmm. and creating inviting people into these environments but they're also you have to show beauty to also look at sort of some of deeper into it potentially there is a wistfulness in this work because of the changes that are occurring in a large scale so not just these minute changes these ephemeral changes that happen very quickly when a wave crashes or when a moon moves. Um, so there's been a lot of that type of um, introspection. Um, sure. And the making of work. But this is a new series. This series started, I didn't work with the indigo before the lockdown occurred. So this is um, a new material, a new medium. It's it's absolutely spectacular. And I'm excited <laughs> that we were able to preview some of it here. Yes. This it's great. Um, Mia, I think as we wrap up, we have maybe our kind of our last takeaway question, um, maybe in one word or two words, what would you say is a positive? I mean, we've spoken a lot about some positive takeaways, but Mm -hmm. maybe what is one word that you would want the listeners today to take away from, from what your experience has been over the past, you know, year or so? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not an easy question. <laughs> no, no, this is a really straightforward question because the most important word that would be my key word for this whole experience, it, you know, J- Japanese is my first language. So I, yes. I no, say a lot of Japanese words. We're getting and a lesson most, today. But if, no, I don't mean, I really, I'm No, no, in a great way. Not, I don't want <laughs> to do, but um. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there are words that do not have uh, translations in English, sure. and I, I, I guess I've been sort of privy. I, it 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 um, it weighs on me a little bit that things are missing 
from various cultures. It's really very mm-hmm. interesting. There's a word called heijoshin, and heijoshin is a Japanese word which means calm under any circumstance. And it's a word that it belongs to the samurai. It's, it, it, well, it doesn't belong to them, but it was, it was a discipline and a practice for samurai during that period of time. Because of course, if you're carrying around two very dangerous objects, but typically samurai had two swords, they only have one purpose. And they're very, very, very sharp and dangerous. And the gravitas of holding these things on your body, on your person, is important to maintain in the mind. Anyone can be calm when it's peaceful and calm. Mm -hmm. To remain calm under duress or in Mm -hmm. circumstances that are challenging. This is, so I am not, this, so it, it is, I would say a practice more than anything or an ideal and I my mom said that to me and um, of course you know this is something that I I try to hold that Mm -hmm. things might be radically shifting I also try to remind myself and comfort myself by knowing that there are also things that never change the moon doesn't change you know those types of things you know Yes, the water, the seas are rising, but I go out and, and look at the ocean and the, that infinite mm-hmm. kind of idea of, of things that don't change like waves and tides. So that would be the, <laughs> my, that would be my key it. phrase. So. I love it. And I think it's something, I, I like the actionability of it. I think beyond mm-hmm. being a state of, be, state of being, it is a practice as well. So it's something that, you know, as long as you assume it every day, you're kind of casting a vote for, you know, and grace I, I under pressure. So. And I think art and the things we see change our state of mind. And that's yes. the, the, the power of art. That's the beauty of art. And yeah. there are so many forms of it, but that's, the, that's why art is so incredibly important and poignant is that these things are opportunities they are moments for us to yeah. regard them and to contemplate and that's really um the profound um power i think that is yeah. art and then the privilege for us to be participant in the making and the looking and um and we all take away something and is something that is unique and different and that i think that is the most important thing you know no, <laughs> i think I, that is, I, I don't want to sound preachy <laughs> No, no. And this has been so special. I mean, not only did we get to speak with you, but we got a beautiful preview of your new body of work. Your studio is spectacular. And I, you know, I just, as we conclude today, I just want to say thank you so much for your time, Mia. And it's been really, really fun. Thank you so much. It's lovely to speak with you.